the way I like to run these lectures is I'm going to lecture from slides, and then we're going to go over and do some coding. We go back and forth. I like it when students, while I'm lecturing, put questions in the chat, because I like all the microphones to be muted while I'm lecturing. I check the chat every minute or two. Um, and this is meant to be as interactive as, as possible. When I am done lecturing, um, what we will do is I'll open it up. I'll open the mic up if you have questions about anything in the lecture, if you have questions about a lab, if you have questions about a project. That's the time to bring them up, open up your mic. We will talk about them. If you have code that you're questioning, have it ready and, and either, um, and you know, maybe have it in a PY file or have an image so we can review it. And I will do that for anyone who has any questions in the class uh, every Thursday night. So I'm going to get started now with the lecture. And if you have questions right now, please put them in the chat. So module one, what we are doing in Python is we are learning to communicate with a computer and have that computer do what we want it to do. That's the ultimate goal of all of this. The tool that we're using is called Python. Now, Python has syntax and logical challenges and all this stuff that we get to learn. And Python's a really good language to learn. It really is very helpful. It's better than some other languages if you don't want to be close to the, uh, to the machine, the computer. So what is programming? Programming or program flow is got three steps. You've got input, you've got process, and you've got output. That's it. Whether you're programming on a Cray com computer or I'm programming on my little Mac or you're programming on whatever your whatever computer you've got and whatever language you've got, there are three steps, input, process, and output. And when you understand what you do for each of those steps, Programming becomes a little easier, especially if you haven't dealt with breaking the concept of a task down or a problem down into individual tasks. That's one of the things we're going to be looking at throughout these lectures is we're going to look at the problems, we're going to look at how to break them down, we're going to see what Python does with the information we give it. Um, because while programming does kind of thrive on the concept of a black box, you put some data in and you get some data out, it's important for me and I think for most programmers to understand what Python is doing to store our data and to retrieve our data and how it handles our data. So this week and next week when we go over code, we're going to be using flowcharts. And flowcharts are important, partly because you're going to have to do an assignment with a flowchart, but also they help give a language-neutral graphical representation of what it is you're supposed to be doing. I like flowcharts. I like the pictures. Some people prefer pseudocode. On week three, we will start talking about pseudocode and using pseudocode. Um, part of that is because the problems become so complex starting in week three that I can't fit them on a, on a slide. So we're going to use the pseudocode. And by the way, at the end of every lecture, before I open it up, we will go through each of the labs and the logical steps for each of the labs. So this picture, you have a start and an end, and you have input, process, and output. That's what you're going to see on all the, the slides this week and all the slides next week. And get used to these shapes. Shapes are important in flowcharts. I have a lot of students that lose points because they don't have the shapes right in week three. So let's talk about the building blocks of a program. The first building block 
is something called a variable. A variable can be seen as a bucket. And, you know, you have something you want to put in the bucket. Maybe you have tennis balls. It's a lot easier to carry 10 tennis balls around in a bucket than it is in your arms. Um, and we can name our bucket. So a variable is some place to store stuff. I'm going to call that stuff data because it can be lots of different things. I can name my bucket. So every variable has a name and that has to be unique to the running program. Every variable contains something and every variable has a scope. Now I'm just going to talk about scope a teeny bit here because by week three, when we get into week three, we're going to start concentrating on local and global scope. Everything we do in weeks one and week two is in the global scope. So you won't have to worry about scope and where things are until week three. So that's what a variable is. And when we talk about a variable, we are talking specifically about a place to store a piece of information. That piece of information can be your name. It could be your age. It could be a long, a big database you can store in a single variable. So variable names have to start with a character. They cannot start with a number and they cannot start with an underscore. They may not contain spaces or special characters. You can have an underscore. That's your special character in a variable name. Okay, so I've got this thing called a variable. Well, how in the world do I use it? What is the syntax associated with a variable? Some languages like Java, you have to like type them. Um, Python is what they call a loosely typed language. Python will figure out the type based on the kind of data. Now, one of the things we do when we talk about teaching programming is we teach people how to write programs, but we don't teach people how to read them. We're going to both read and write programs in this class. So what I have here on the page is the word amount, an equal sign, and the number 10. Amount is a variable. The name of the variable is amount. I know it's a variable when I'm reading my Python program because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is the value or the piece of data that that amount, that that variable is going to store. Now, why do I want to name the number 10? Well, because maybe I don't just want to have number 10 as amount. Maybe I want to be able to change that amount and see what differences are in a calculation. Maybe sometimes I want the amount to be 10, or maybe sometimes I want the amount to be 20. I don't have to rewrite my code if the value changes, if I'm using a variable name. And I'll show you what that means in a bit. Now, with this line of code, something happens on the computer. And what happens is, Python says, I have a name called amount, and I have a variable, I have a value for amount called 10, and it keeps a table, okay? Underlying in Python, it keeps a table in memory of every single variable, its name, and its current value, whatever value is at the time, because values can change in variables. So if you're thinking about amount equal 10, and what is really happening on the computer is I've just taken up space in the computer with this variable, variable, and that value. By the way, there are two resources on all computers currently in the world because we haven't like gotten to quantum computing yet. There is space and there is speed. Space is how much RAM you have what your disk size is, whether it be an SSD or, a, or you know, spinning hard drive. Um, so that space. 
everything we do in this class is going to run in RAM. Then there is speed. Speed is how fast it runs. Now we're not going to worry a lot about speed in this class because we're not writing things that have to go really, really, really fast. Um, but you have to understand that there are only two resources. Why am I talking about those? Because every time I define a variable, I take up a resource in the computer because I take up more space out of my computer memory. Now, it's not something we have to worry about in this class that we're going to run out of computer memory. But for me and from my perspective, I think it's always good to understand what's going on on the computer. And that's what's going on when you define a variable. Your Python takes up space for the name, and it takes up whatever space is needed for that value. And it holds on to it until the program stops. And that will be the way it works until week seven when we learn how to write things out into files. And by the way, sorry, I haven't looked at the chat yet. So we're good. Okay. All right. So how do I use a variable? So let's say I have a little Python script. Let's talk about this Python script for just a sec second. I am going to do something with total coins and with a nickel count and a dime count. Now this is kind of getting you up to one of your labs. And if you want to follow along with this, there's an associated script down at the bottom of the slide, which is challenge underscore 11.11.2.py, a, a link to that, and all of the other challenge solutions are in the description for this week's video. So let's read through this for just a minute. I have a variable called total coins. I know total coins is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And we'll find out in week three why I keep saying single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is my value. So I have a variable called total coins that is storing the value of zero. Then I have nickel count. Now nickel count is again on the left hand side of a single equal sign, so I know it is a variable, and I am assigning some value to that variable. Well, in this case, I'm assigning, okay, sorry, let me get, catch the slide up. So in this case, I am assigning what? I'm assigning, oh, I'm going in the wrong order. Those are all my variable names. Here we go. There's the assignment operator. There's Yuli. We all have assignment operator. Sorry. Yep. Uh, is the uh, is the audio section uh, on video? I'm just oh uh, yeah, in the audio I can see whatever you're doing over. Sorry. Could you say that again? I'm uh, sorry. I are you doing a session on the video, on the conference, like a video conference? Because I'm on audio right now. I can see what you're doing over there. Yes. Are you are you on free conference call? Can anybody see what I'm doing? I'm recording and sharing my screen. Uh, I'm on the free conference call, but you just gave me audio. I was trying to do like a face sound video or something, but it's not coming up. Okay. Um, I will, this will be posted on the YouTube channel tonight. If you want to listen, mm -hmm. you can. If you want to um, disconnect and um, reconnect, that's completely fine and give it a try. Um, okay. David, what's FCC? Oh, free conference call. Yeah, never mind. Mm -hmm. So um, go ahead and try and disconnect and reconnect. If you've got the free conference call, it should show it as a video. Okay. Okay? All right. Okay. So let's get back to where we were. So I've got one, two, three variables, even though I've got four things with single equal signs, and that's because I can reuse my total count variable later on. Now, there are a couple of things going on here. 
One is just the assignment, total coins equal zero. However, on nickel count and dime count, I'm not setting it to a value. I'm setting it to something else. What I'm setting it to is the result of a function call. There are a couple of functions you're going to use this week. One of them is input. You will be using input through the rest of the class. The other is int. You might be doing one for care and for stir. Um, these are functions that Python gives you just because you're using Python. There's, you know, it, there's no, you don't have to do anything special. Python just gives them to you. Input allows Python, and specifically in this case is iBooks, to receive data from someplace outside of the running program. Most of what we're going to do here is somebody's going to be typing that in. If I'm testing your stuff, I'll be typing it in. Zybooks will be virtually typing it in. So input is very important, and it is also how Zybooks gets the data it wants to test into your program. So if you're not using input and you've got one thing, that one, one test submission that works and the rest don't, it's probably because you need to use the input function. Int is a converter. It says, take something and make it an integer. And we'll talk about the different types in just a couple minutes. But, and then I have reused total coins. Uh, so I can reuse variables in Python. I can set it the same variable name equal as many times as I want. And in this case, I have an arithmetic expression on the fourth line down I have an arithmetic expression that just says nickel count plus dime count so the product of sorry yeah the product of nickel count and dime count is whatever total coins is and then there's another function at the bottom called print print is the way we visually see what's happening on the screen all of the stuff we're doing is text based and so print is going to be how you return the information, how I'm going to see things when you turn in the assignments, and how Zybooks is going to check whether or not your lab is done correctly. And here I'm using nickel count and I'm using dime count, and I'm going to use total coins to output the results. Okay, variable type. There are four kinds of variables that we care about. There's string, integer, float, and Boolean. We don't, we're not going to worry about Boolean this week. We, we start talking about Boolean in week three. A string is an ordered collection of letters. And we're going to deep dive into strings next week. An integer is just a whole number, 42. A float is a number with a decimal point. That, it's that simple. Python will default to a string if it doesn't know what else to do with it. So with your input statements, with your input function calls, everything's a string and you have to convert it if you don't want it to be a string. So I have a line of Python code here. It's my stir equal quote Lisa end quote. Python knows this has to be a string because I have put quotes around it. I have my int and it's 42. No quotes, no decimal places. That's a number. And float is 3.14. No quotes, so it's not a string. There's a number and a decimal place, so it's a float. That's what Python knows. Okay, quick foray into functions. So we've got, how do, what is a function and how do I read it? Python, one of the big things about Python, and one of the reasons why uh, a lot of companies like it is because there are just massive libraries of code out there that you can use. Um, and Python provides a whole lot of functionality just by being Python. You don't have to go out and get special libraries. It's just there. Um, and so a function is a piece of code that I can call by name that does something specific. Now, up until week five, we're going to be 
using functions. On week five, we're going to figure out how to create our own. But there's very specific syntax to this. A function has a name. Function name convention is very much like variable names. You can't have spaces, you can't have special characters, and it is case sensitive. So in here, I just have a function and I've called it function name. Now, there's going to be an open parenthesis and a matching closing parenthesis. This is very important. The parentheses have to be balanced. What that means is there has to be the same number of opening parentheses as there are closing parentheses. Now this one's e easy to see because it's just one opening and one closing parenthesis. There are times when you're going to have multiple opening and closing parentheses and you're going to need to balance them. And then sometimes functions have arguments in between the parentheses. That argument is some piece of data that you want that function to do something with. And that something is whatever the purpose of the function is. So let's talk about some more functions. There's a function con to convert string to integer, a function to convert string to float, and a function to convert integer or float to a string. Now, there's a lot more functions. We are going through these because you're going to need to use them this week. So, I have a function called myster, uh, sorry, a variable called myster. Myster is equal to quote 42, end quote. Those quotes make 42 a number, sorry, a string, but I want it to be a number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it. And I convert it using a function by the name of int. And that function takes a string as an argument. And what that function is going to do is it's going to convert that string into an integer. Now why is that important? It's important for two reasons. I can't do arithmetic calculations on strings. I can't add 42 to anything or subtract it from anything when it is a string. I can when it's an integer. When you are using the input function in Python, everything comes in as a string. It doesn't matter if I typed it in with quotes or not. It's going to show up inside Python as a string, and you're going to have to convert it. I can do the same thing with a float. Okay, 3.14, I have a function whose name is float. That function takes inside those parentheses a string, a variable that has a string. In this case, the variable's name is myster. And it will give me back in my conv variable a float. So my string says, quote, 3.14, end quote. My conv variable is going to equal 3.14. That's what that line does with conv equals float, open parenthesis, myster, close parenthesis. And I can go back the other way. I have an integer, which is 42, and I want to turn it into a string. I will then convert it using the str function, str, open parenthesis, either an integer or a float, close parenthesis. Okay, input and output. When people think about computers these days, because I'm old, a um, long, long time ago, there wasn't great user interfaces. I was around when Microsoft started. Um, not wasn't working for Microsoft, but I was I was in the computer industry at the time, and um, people had text user interfaces. That's what they did. IRC chats were all text user interfaces. So you had to you you input on your keyboard and you got something back on the screen. You input on your keyboard and you got something back on your screen. There were no joysticks. There were no mice. Um, and I know I'm aging myself. So what we envision today as input is nothing like what we're going to do in this class. In this class, all of our input is going to be text. When I am testing 
your programs, I'm running them and I'm inputting things into a text terminal. And I'm going to show you in a minute what that looks like. Um, so I ha there has to be a way to get information into the program and information out of the program. There are two functions that you use for this. The one to get information into the program is called input. Now, input can take a value, excuse me, that is a string. That string is output to the user to tell them what to do. What, what are you waiting for? And then input will stop processing until somebody responds. The other side of that is print. Print takes one or many arguments and it will output information to the screen. So if we've got input, process, and output, in the input function is input, the output function is print, and process is whatever I do to it in the middle. So we're going to stop for just a second. Yes. So when it gives us numbers, I need to forget the number, the numbers, correct? So having okay, so what do you mean I need to forget the numbers? So when it gives us numbers, I need to forget the numbers. I'm not sure so that I understand that. It's okay. me, Aaron. I was the one who typed it. So what That's I mean fine. is whenever I was trying to do it on the um, assignments, I was trying to incorporate the numbers. Instead of doing like input integer or int, I was yes. trying to incorporate the number and that was what was throwing me off. So that's what I meant by it. Okay, yes. that That's probably what was going on then. If you were just putting like int and then the number 42. Yes. And your labs were coming out with one right and the rest wrong. That's yes. the issue. So okay. that's what I meant, like I need to forget about the number itself and just put input int instead of like putting integer and the number, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes absolute sense. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And then so having the int is only to change the string like a number, so you use mathematics for it. That's exactly right, Josh. So let's go to PyCharm. Now, I start using PyCharm this week. Even though you guys don't have to do anything with it till next week, PyCharm is what you are going to use for all of your programming assignments. It's very handy. It's called an integrated development environment. And it, it has some features that I think are very useful and I think are very useful for new programmers. So. Right now, I have a Python script called simpleinput.py. And by the way, I always get these questions. If you are trying to submit a .py file and you don't know where it is, what you can do is mouse onto the tab, right click or control click. Hold on. There we go. For me on my Mac. And here it will say reveal in Finder. On a Windows system, it will say like open in folder. And that will take you right to the place where the .py file is so you can submit it to Brightspace. And for my students, there is um, an announcement with that information in it. So this is an input function. I'm going to input something and then I'm going to print it out. That's all this is going to do. It's not going to do anything in between. But I wanted to show you a couple of things with this. So I'm going to debug. Now you will find that debugging is my favorite thing to do when it comes to using an IDE because it brings into sharp relief what is actually happening in the computer. There is no mystery here. There are things that happen in a very specific order and in a very specific way. So. What we see here is we see my Python script. There's a red dot, and now there's a blue line. That red dot in debug mode tells PyCharm, when you hit that line of code, stop. Just stop. Don't do anything else. 
until somebody says continue. How do I say continue? A couple of different ways. There's this little button right here that says resume the program. It's just going to start running again until it meets, gets to the, little, the, the next little red dot or the end of the program. There is step over. Step over says, okay, execute this line of code and do whatever it says. And then go to the next line and stop. Step into, we will be using when we get to functions. Because we're going to define our own functions and we're going to want to see what they do. So those are my favorite ones. You can find also frames and variables. This is a tab. This is the console tab. This is where I'm going to get to put stuff in and information is going to come back to me. Frames and variables tells me what's happening in the memory of my program. Remember when I said, you know, Python keeps space for the variable name and, and gets space for the value? This is where we're actually going to see that happening. So I am stopped on line four. Now, Line one, two, and three didn't need stopping because there was nothing to do. These lines are just comments. They're just text. They will not be run. Python will skip them every time. I'm on my first executable line of code. And it says my var equals input, input something. So if I'm going to input from the console, but the words input something aren't here. They're not here because that line of code has not executed yet. When I step over that line of code, input something shows up right there. You will also see that the blue line is no longer on line four. It is now a kind of a burgundy or maroon line because that means that line of code is waiting for something else to happen. And what it's waiting to happen is it's waiting for me to type something in. So I can type 42. And it says my var is, quote, 42, end quote. And if I go to frames and variables, and I go to the variables tab, I now have my variable equal to stir, because it says it's a string, the string 42. So that's what's being taken up in my program. Now I want to see what happens when I print. So. I stepped over, so I just went to the next line of code. It's on line 7 waiting because it hasn't executed line 7 yet. It's going to execute line 7 when I step over. And when I do that, print shows me 42 on the screen. So that's what input and print do. And they become very important because how you input things or especially with Zybooks, how you print them out is going to determine whether you get really frustrated with Zybooks or not. So let's go back to this. And we're going to go over how to call the input function. And this is similar to what you will probably be doing in your one of your labs. This is challenge 1.3.4 and we can also go through this in code if you want. And it just says read two numbers from user input then print the sum of those numbers. So when I see the words read two numbers from user input I have to remember that I'm going to use the input function. So there we go. I'm going to have my flowchart kind of building on the side while I build this code so you can get an idea of what's happening. So I have num1 equal int input open close parenthesis. Now in the, the script I just ran, there was something in the middle of input. Zybooks does not like it when there are things inside input, except for one of the labs you're going to do this week. Most of the time, you will have input with nothing in between the parentheses when you're dealing with Zybooks. When you're dealing with the scripts that you're going to write 
for this class as assignments, you're going to need to have something in between. So I just wanted to explain why there was a difference. So num1 is going to be an int, and that int is going to be input by somebody or something, either by me or by Zybooks. So num1 is a variable name. I know it's a variable name because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The right-hand side of a single equal sign tells me that I'm going to have external input into my program, and it's going to be turned into an integer. So I have open parentheses. I have two open parentheses. So I have to have two closed parentheses. And if I don't have that, then I'm going to get a syntax error. And I'll show you what those errors are going to be in a bit. So Professor Lisa here, she's typing in. I'm going to type in the number 2. So I've input 2. Now I'm going to, I'm going to have another variable, num2. I again want it to be um, I want it I want it to be an integer and I'm going to get it from the uh, from the console and I'm going to type in four so I've done some more input so now I'm going to process I'm going to do something with two and four so I'm going to print num one and num two and so num one has the value of two. Num four has sorry, num two has the value of four. And that right there is my process. And then I'm going to output the product or the sum, sorry, of num one and num two. And that's going to go to the screen and it's going to be six. And then my program's going to end. Okay. On this slide, the new thing that we're seeing here is that you can have one function call inside of another. And that's what int and input are. They are input is inside int because the result, the product that comes out of input is going to be immediately passed into the int function. For every parenthesis, you have to have a corresponding close parenthesis. Print can be a string, integer, or boolean. However, if a string is used in print, then integers and floats have to be converted to a string. Okay, how to call the print function. This is challenge 1.3.2. Um, and actually, instead of doing it on the slide, I think what we're going to do is we're going to do it here. So I'm going to go to 1.3.2. Is that it? No. Which one was it? I said 1.3.2. 3, 2, 1, go. I got that number wrong. I apologize. Okay. I don't know which one it is. 3.2. One point three point one. Why don't I have that there? Huh. Well, I need to add that. My apologies. So let's pick another one. We'll just go over this slide. And um oh that's the important part. The print function can have two different the print function can have multiple different kinds of arguments. So there's a single argument or multiple arguments. So the print function, you have the function name and open parentheses, some argument, and then the closed parentheses. And that argument is what's going to be printed out to the screen. You can also have two arguments. You can have print. And this one, I have two prints. The first one has two arguments. And this is important because you're probably going to need that this week. Um, it has a string, and then there's a comma, and then I have this thing called end equal, in this case it's a quote space quote. What that print statement does is it says don't do a new line. Unless you tell it to not do a carriage return, print will always do a carriage return. But sometimes you want things printed out on the same line. 
so you have end equal and then a space is just going to say okay instead of doing a carriage return just put a space all right what's the next one secret life of a python script um so here we're talking about working 40 hours a week and I know this is I'm sorry I'm not as organized okay thank you Whitney so let me find that one I don't see this one in here. Okay. That's the convert, similar to lab, print, spaces and spaces, date and expression, variable. Okay. Why is that one wrong? Anyway, we'll go back and just go over the slide and then we'll check out some things. So this is basically, again, about input process and output. And we have an hourly wage. We're going to input that hourly wage. Then we're going to figure out how much you're going to earn yearly. So it's hourly times 40 times 50. And then we're going to figure out monthly, and then we're going to print them out. And what will come out is annual salary is 40000 So let me do this. I can just, well, let me see. Now we want to keep going. Yeah, we need to keep going. Okay, statements and expressions. So, you, there's, there's a slight difference between statements and expressions. I don't get hung up on the terminology. A statement generally is dealing with input and output. An expression is your process. You're going to be doing something to that data. So you're, mod you're changing the data in some way. And I'm only going over this because Zybooks goes over it. Um, and so what you'll see here is the inputs and outputs are statements, and the expression is when you're doing your process and your calculations. Cases and spaces matter. This one's important. Python is a case-sensitive language and a space-delimited language. What does that mean? That means that a lowercase x and an uppercase x are not the same thing just because they're x. Python sees that x and that uppercase x as two completely separate things. They have no relation to each other. Um, so they're both var variables, but they could store separate values without a problem, without affecting each other. Python is also a space-delimited language. Some languages you have to put um, a character, often a semicolon, when your statement or expression is done. You don't have to do that in Python. Python expects the new line, or sometimes a colon and a new line to indicate that you're done with that particular expression. So for example here I have x equal 2 and y equal 4. Python knows those are two separate statements because they're on different lines. If I tried to say x equal 2 and y equal 4 on the same line Python would give me a syntax error. And that's because not all characters are the same. You've heard of the ASCII table. They're also not our, not all characters are look, characters are visible. You have spaces, you have tabs, and you have new lines that are not. And starting next week when we do strings, we're going to kind of get into that more. There are also special characters um, where backslash is your friend. And again, we're going to get into that more next week. I did want to talk to it a little bit because Zybooks talks about it this week. And basically an escape sequence just allows you to use a special character in a way that is um, that's, that it's not expecting it to be used. 
We have arithmetic operators. They're the same as in math. Plus, minus, multiplication is a star, division is a slash, and exponent is star star. Okay. All right, so lab 1.9. And we're going to complete a program to read four variables from input and store the variables in four different uh, variable names. They give us the variable names. First name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. So that means we're going to have four input statements. And then it's going to use it to output a story. So I have start. I'm going to input first name, I'm going to input generic location, I'm going to input whole number, I'm going to input plural noun, and then I'm going to output them all as a sentence. And the Zybooks lab gives you that sentence. You don't have to do anything, but you do have to make sure that your variables are named correctly. So lab 1.2 is a little bit more um, is a little bit more complex. There are three parts, and it reads a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. Expand the given program as indicated. Output the user's input. So you're going to have a variable called usernum. User number is going to be assigned a value based on the fact that it was input from Zybook. So you're going to have to use the input statement. Then it's going to output the input squared and cubed. So you're going to compute the square, user num times user num. And then the cubed is user num times user num times user num. And then you're going to print that out. So you've got no line two does not require any additional input. The third one requires additional input. You're going to have now input user num2, and you're going to output the sum and the product of user num and user num2. So there are two different places where you need to use input statements. All of these require the use of the print statement for output. So I'm going to start in my graph. I'm going to input user num. I'm going to convert user num to integer. I'm going to square it, and then I'm going to output it. So that gives me up to 2. I didn't cube it. And now I'm going to cube user num, and I'm going to output it. And then I'm going to have a, another input statement, and I'm going to get in some integer for user num2. I'm going to sum it. I'm going to sum user num and user num2. I'm going to output it. I'm going to multiply it. I'm going to output it again. And then I'm going to end. Now, it is important to remember that when you see here input user num and then convert user num to integer, that doesn't have to be two separate lines of code. Both pseudocode and flowcharts are, at, are language agnostic. So you can just as easily have an int function and then inside of it you put an input function. And then you're done. Now we're going to write a program using integers, user num and x as input and output the user num divided by x three times. So I'm going to have one, in, I'm going to have two inputs, user num and x. And then I'm going to have different outputs. So two inputs. And I have one print function here, but you're going to have to print something out three times. So I'm going to start it. I'm going to input user num. I'm going to input x. I'm going to convert, convert it to an integer. I have to use that int function. I'm going to convert it to an integer again. I'm going to divide, say div equal user num divided by x. I'm going to output div. And then I'm going to say div2 equals div divided by x. So I'm not going to say use user num again. I'm going to use basically the, um, 
the output of my first calculation for my second calculation. I'm going to output div 2 and then again I'm going to have now div 3 using div 2 divided by x. I'm going to output that and I'm going to be done. So, and by the way, there are a lot of labs. Not all of the, mod uh, the modules in Zybooks have this many labs. So, 1.24, I'm writing a programming, and I'm going to use inputs age, weight, heart rate, and time. So these are variable names again that they are giving you. And then I'm going to output that following line. So what you need to do is when you're all done, you need to have a variable called calories with a lower C with your information in it. So it can be used in that print statement. And that print statement is provided in the Zybooks lab. You don't have to type it in. So I've got some functions, some inputs, and some outputs. So I'm going to start as usual. I'm going to input age. I got four inputs here. I'm going to input weight. I'm going to input heart rate. And I'm going to input time. All of these have to be converted to integers. So don't forget the conversion because if you do, you'll get an error. And I'll show you what those errors would look like in just a minute. I just wanted to get through these in case people don't want to stay because this is going to run uh, after 10. So now I'm going to do a calculate. I'm going to calculate the calories and the calculation itself is provided in the script. And then I'm going to output my calories using that statement and I'm going to be done. So the major work here is making sure that you're inputting everything and, and I see students struggle with this sometimes, you need to have a variable called calories with a lowercase c spelled just like that, or that print statement won't work. So, 2.1, sorry, 1.25 is kind of big. And what they want us to do is they want us to input an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string, and then output those four variables in a single line sentence separated by a space. So remember when I said print can take two arguments? One of those can be an end equal quote space quote. That's what you're going to do here. You're also going to extend out, you're going to also output it in the reverse. And then you're going to convert the integer to a character using the chr function and output that as a character. So that's the integer as a character. And CHR works just like STR. So you put an integer in between those parentheses and it will give you the corresponding character. So we're going to start. We got some inputs to do. We're going to input our user int or make sure we convert it. We're going to input our user float and we're going to input the character. And I'm going to input a string. And so now I'm going to go and I'm going to output things in the order user int, user float, user care, and user stir. And I'm going to output them in the reverse order. So I don't really have to do much here. And then I have to convert user int to a character using the care function. So you can look in Zybooks for that. There is also a reference down here to how the care function is used from W3Schools, which is a very good resource. And um, that, that will also show you how you're supposed to use it. So then I'm going to output the character, and I'm going to be done. So let's go. You can, we can open up the mics. I wanted to go, and I wanted to show you some, um, let's see. Similar to lab. Okay, so let's just go over this for a real quick minute. This is similar to lab and it's starting to kind of get you a little bit used to what they're talking about. So I have a, a .py file with first name, 
and location, and I'm going to print it into a sentence. So this is the only thing that I have to do. So I'm going to, that's all I'm going to do. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to set it as my configuration, and that is similar to lab. Okay. And I'm just going to run it. And I'm going to input. This is what's weird because there's nothing here prompting me. But that's because of the way Zybooks wants you to do things. So the first name is Lisa and the generic location is Tahiti. Ta T-A-H-I-T, sorry, I-T-I, I wish. And then it says Lisa went to Tahiti. I want to, let me see this one. Okay. This one shows a little bit about how we're doing with format. So I want to do a couple of things here. I want to, um, yeah, let's debug this one. Okay, whoops. Okay, so let me stop that. I'm going to debug this guy. We're going to just stop and look. So I've got enter user input, and I've got my int, and then I've got input and enter a number. Some people get a little confused here because they think that enter a number is what is actually being used in input, and it's only being used to prompt me as to what I need to do. So I'm going to step over that. I've got enter number. It's going to be 42. And I have now a number that's 42, and I know it's an integer. And if you're ever curious, you can go and look, sorry, at PyCharm. I have user input and it is of type int. By the way, if you start to have weird problems or you don't understand if your code is working or what's happening, it, you can simply copy it out off of the browser and into PyCharm and run it and see if you've got syntax errors or see or walk through it as a debugger. It can be a very helpful tool in the lab. So I'm going to print user input which is out here at the console. And I'm going to print, this was the user input. I'm going to, now what I've got here is a different form of print. And it basically, and we'll talk about this a little bit more next week. It has a placeholder for the data. And it says the user was 42. And I'm going to input a float. And it's asking me to input a float. And it's waiting. I'm going to input 3.14. Now, here is more format stuff, and we're going to get into it a little more next week. This is a placeholder that tells it exactly how it wants it to look, and that's 3.14. Let me, if there are any challenges that um, anybody has gone over that they've had trouble with or would like me to go over? Okay, so let me see. Um, oh, here's something I wanted to show you real quick. If your parentheses aren't balanced, this is what will happen if you attempt to run your program. You will get this. Now, this isn't very helpful. Why isn't it helpful? Because it's telling you that the error is on print user input on that line of code. And in fact, it says line 14. When you go to line 14, line 14 is perfect. It's exactly what it needs to be. Programmers aren't good at telling you what's wrong with your program. There are some IDEs which are better than others. But the, the actual error message is leading you to the wrong place. What you need to do is you need to start looking backwards up the program. So I'm going to start by looking at line 13. And lo and behold, I realized that I have two opening parentheses and only one closing parentheses. So when I close that parentheses, 
everything goes back to normal, the red squiggly lines go away. The other thing you will find is if I want to print uh, a string and the user input. Now, I'm not getting a syntax error, but let's see what happens when I run the program. I'm going to enter a number. I'm going to enter a float. And then I have a problem. Now, this says that on line 22, I have a line that says this is a string plus user input. And it says type error can only concatenate stir, not int to stir. That is because, and, and I didn't get a syntax error here. I did not get a red squiggly. Red squigglies in PyCharm say you got a syntax error. So this is a runtime error. And the problem is that Python can't add two things of different types. So if I want to add these together, and adding strings together means you're just butting one string up against the other, I would have to use the stir function here. And I can run it. And I'm going to go 42. I'm going to do 3.14. And I'm going to have this string is 42. And it worked because what I did was I converted it. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about this week. Does anybody have any questions? Going once. Whoops. Going twice. <laughs> Oh, I have a question. So, hey, so in Zybooks, we don't have to convert the input or the integers into strings and strings into floats. All on the age and weight and um, all that, we, all we had to do is the integer um, open parenthesis age, close parenthesis. Why is it on here that you're doing it to the converting part? Um because my my thought is that in Zybooks they have used this format. So if I did this, forty two, four. I don't have to do that because I'm using what's called a placeholder and I and it can also be a format specifier. So that's when Zybooks gives you the print statements, that's what they're doing. Some people when they are doing their own input and output will try and um sorry about that. will try and concatenate them together and that won't work. So it depends on how you're using those, um, how you're using the print statement. But that's why there's a difference. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I should have turned off my notifications. Uh, not disturb. Should have done that earlier. Did anybody have any other questions? Um, and by the way, next week, if you want to go over your labs first and have some questions, bring them to me, and we will actually do some code reviews of where your problems might lie. We can also do that about assignments. Um, so I think I'm going to call it now. If you're in my class, feel free to email me. Um, I usually try and get back to you within like a day sometimes within the same day, depending on what my work schedule is like. Um, and yeah, if you're in other classes, I really prefer that you go through your own professor. This will be up tomorrow with the description in it, with the links to the, pro, um, with the flow charts, which go over the individual labs, and with links to the scripts that we saw in this video plus all of the other challenges. 
So I hope everyone enjoyed the class, and I hope you have a good evening. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop the recording.